Good morning, and welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim as we continue our journey, A Prophet in Babylon, with Chapter 19, Part A. Chapter 19 is titled, Butler's Inquisition. Gaunt did not return to Olivia and her brother as he had intended. He was recalled to New York by an urgent letter from Butler. This letter discussed certain new developments in the League, which may now be briefly described. In six months, the League had enrolled close upon 200,000 members. Its success had thus been instantaneous and beyond exception. Each member had contributed the dollar asked in annual subscription, so that there was now ample means for the prosecution of the work. It was this fund that sent out the young apostles, which equipped certain mission halls in the poorer districts of New York, and which maintained the Sisters of the Poor, a group of noble women of whom Olivia Jordan was one, who gave six hours of each day to every form of personal service among the destitute. The badge of the Cross of Stars had become familiar in New York, but both Gaunt and Butler had seen for a long time that all this social work, excellent as it was, was remedial, not radical. They knew that they were dealing with the results of wrong, not with the causes. During all these months, Butler had been conducting a quiet but thorough campaign of investigation into the causes of social misery. By the end of the summer, his investigation was complete, and hence his letter to Gaunt. It was an exquisite September morning when Gaunt returned to New York. As he looked upon the city, bathed in the fresh gold of the dawn, he felt something of that thrill which the provincial felt twenty centuries ago when he saw the white wonder of Nero's palace flash across the Tiber, which the Gascon feels when he approaches Paris, the dweller among the pastured stillness feels when he beholds the vast disarray of London. No wonder men were intoxicated with the charm of great cities. No wonder they were inspired in a sense of limitless freedom, in which the irksome bonds of personal responsibility seemed to dissolve. Beneath broad and empty skies, in the open places of the world, it was natural that men should realize the presence of unknown powers, that they should quiver with spiritual apprehension, that they should seek to reconcile their conduct to invisible and awful standards. Men had always built their altars in the silent groves and on the bare mountaintops. But here all was human, palatable, the work of men's hands. In these immense highways of houses, these streets echoing with the wheels above and veined with fire and speed below, in this incessant march of life, as of an endless pageant, perpetually renewed, there was no breathing space for individual life. The individual was overwhelmed in the mass, and hence the perilous exhilaration, the sense that nothing mattered, neither duty nor piety, that men could be and do as they willed, and that no higher power watched or cared. What was the individual but a pebble carried outward by a great torrent, that wore it down into a shape common to a million neighbor pebbles. And Gaunt, fresh from those great outdoor audiences in small cities, with their receptivity of ideas, felt anew how little there was to hold to in these millionfold personalities ground smooth in the attrition of New York. How, in the very nature of things, men in such conditions became subdued to the element of greed and lust and wrong in which they worked. God help me, he prayed silently, as the cab sped along Fifth Avenue and Broadway. It is in the city that my problem lies, my battlefield, for it is in the cities that the whole corruption of mankind begins. It was still early dawn when Gaunt reached Washington Square in the House of Joy, but the household was already astir and at work. Palmer met him with a shout of welcome. And so you've had a great time, he said. Yes, thanks to you, I feel as though I've never learned to preach till now. Next summer we'll put five hundred men in the field. How about Olivia Jordan, said Palmer. He flushed slightly as he uttered her name. I've left her nursing her brother. He's doing well, but it will probably be some weeks before he is quite recovered. And then? Then I must see what I can do with Jordan. If the father were only like the daughter, said Palmer. Then he added abruptly, you know, I've seen a good deal of Olivia Jordan since she joined the sisterhood. She's the best worker we have. There's something about her. She has such a gentle way with her that the roughest people love her, 
and I know some who almost worship her. And you, said Gaunt, with a humorous glance at his friend. Oh, I'm no exception, he said gravely. Butler entered at that moment. The great editor looked worn and weary. Usually he had spent August in his little house on Long Island, but this year he had not been there for more than a few days. You look tired, said Gaunt. Oh, I've no time to be tired, Butler replied. I believe I'm made on the principle of the wonderful one-horse shay. When I go to pieces, it will be all at once and all together. Gaunt hastily swallowed a cup of coffee and followed the two men into the quiet room at the back of the house, which served him for an office. And now, said Butler, let us get to work. First of all, you'll be interested to hear that while you've been away, I have refused a donation of $50,000 from William Stonecroft. Stonecroft? What made him offer $50,000? asked Gaunt. An uneasy conscience, said Butler, dryly. We've grown powerful enough that he offered bribes. However, that's an incident, he said, though it has its significance. I should have refused in any case, because our principle is that this is a people's movement, which must be supported by the people. Isn't Stonecroft a member of Jordan's church? asked Palmer. He is. That's where the significance lies. Now let me tell you all I have ascertained about Stonecroft and you may take his case as typical of the kind of problem we have now to face. He is a member of Jordan's church. Good. Jordan would no doubt tell you that he is an exemplary member. Certainly he gives largely to all church purposes, and is a regular attendant at worship. The man is charitable, and if you met him you would be charmed with his kindly manners. Now for the other side. He has a large dry goods store, as you know, and employs a great number of girls. The other day a young girl of my acquaintance, a beautiful, well-educated girl, whose father had been unfortunate in business, applied at his store for a situation. It was a last resource. She had been brought up in the lap of wealth. When reverses came, she resolved instantly to work for her living, and knowing Stonecroft's reputation as a religious man, applied at his store for a situation. The manager met her with compliments. Yes, he could give her a situation at once. He then offered her five dollars a week. But, she said in alarm, I couldn't possibly live upon that. Well, he replied with a brutal smile, you can take a companion. All the girls do. She stared at him for a moment, not in the least comprehending what he meant. The man continued smiling, and the smile at last enlightened her. She burst into tears and hot with shame, left the store. That's count one against Stonecroft. He pays his girls wages on which they cannot live virtuously, and he knows it. Probably, however, he never thinks of it. He has long ago become blind to the sources of his wealth. Count two is that he is the proprietor of some of the worst house property in New York. Some of his houses are used for immoral purposes. Again, I say that though he must know this, yet he probably never thinks of it. No doubt some agent manages his property for him, and he takes his money without scruple. You are quite sure of these things? said Gaunt. Absolutely, replied Butler. I can give you the exact facts not only about Stonecroft, but about a dozen other men in similar positions. You'll find all the details in my portfolio. Well, what are we to do? That is what I am coming to. But first, let us understand the problem. You and the rest of us are all busy in saving lost people. Has it never struck you that such work is like bailing out a pool while the river still runs into it? We have to begin further up in the source of the river. It is men like Stonecroft who manufacture the misery we are trying to heal. Of course, that is obvious, but the question is how to touch men like Stonecroft. They present the most extraordinary psychological problem of modern society. They go to church, they are charitable, they are pious. Yes, I grant that. I don't believe Stonecroft is a conscious hypocrite. For that matter, I don't believe anyone is. The worst man probably appears quite a decent fellow to himself, even when he is doing his worst actions. The root of the whole anomaly is that men like Stonecroft have never really learned to apply religion to common life. Their natures are built in watertight compartments, in one, religion, in another, business and greed. 
Sunday feelings in one, weekday cuteness in another, and the Sunday man is quite a separate person from the weekday, and the society in which they move is composed of persons of the same order. So it happens that no one blames them, and naturally they themselves are the last persons to recognize the inconsistencies of their own position. I suppose it is no use to suggest the law, said Gaunt. None whatever. Palmer knows that. Yes, said Palmer. I have reason to know. It is not that there isn't law enough to touch men like Stonecroft, but that you can't get it enforced. The trouble all through America is that the law is in advance of public opinion. The good people make good laws, the ordinary people forget them, and the bad people defy them. The result is that there is a compromise all round. The compromise means that anyone who is strong enough and wealthy enough can buy immunity from the law. Yes, that's about the truth, said Butler. You may take it as certain that you can't touch Stonecroft by any process of law. But there is one weapon that can touch him. That is publicity. If he was a genuinely bad man, that weapon would be useless too. But he isn't a bad man. He's good in spots. He really values his religious reputation. It is, therefore, through his religious reputation that I proposed to touch him. And we'll stop there. Next week we'll pick up with Chapter 19, Part B. Until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless.